Thank you and welcome to the show this morning. The topic this morning is Malcolm X. And we're fortunate to have with us to talk about Malcolm X and related matters. Uh, the uh, chairperson of the Africana Studies Department at uh, Tennessee State University, Dr. Amara al -Hadid. And of course, Dr. al -Hadid, let me welcome you to uh, the show this morning. Thank you, Dr. Haynes. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And Dr. al uh, what can we say in reference to uh, what you've already given us? Uh, mm -hmm. Everything from Marcus Garvey to uh, Africans in the New World, historical black colleges, just a whole number of uh, just very interesting and important pieces of information. And we know that uh, what you will give us today in reference to Malcolm X will equal any of that that you've already given us. And so let's uh, start off by uh, perhaps uh, having you to talk about your background, your education, and some of the things that you've been involved in for those few members of our audience who might not have had an opportunity to see any of the 12 or 13 <laughs> different uh, shows that you've given us. So let's mm -hmm. start off and then we'll talk about uh, Malcolm X. Well, first of all, I was born in Montgomery, Alabama. I went to George Washington High School and Alabama State University where I received a bachelor's uh, of uh, sociology and also I had a strong emphasis in psychology. Mm -hmm. I left the Deep South and went out on the West Coast to mm -hmm. California uh, where I received a doctorate in sociology mm -hmm. at the University of California in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. While studying there as a graduate student, I had an opportunity to go to Nairobi, Kenya. Mm -hmm. And it was there in Nairobi, Kenya in 1969 that I uh, converted uh, to the religion of Islam mm -hmm. and I also made the pilgrimage uh, six months later mm -hmm. went to uh, Mecca. Uh, much of this was influenced by reading the autobiography of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. So after I got my worldview uh, and my formal education together, mm -hmm. I then started looking for a job. Okay. And mm -hmm. then of course I interviewed at Tennessee State University, uh, Fisk, Meharry mm -hmm. and a few other places and I settled on Tennessee State mm -hmm. University. Been at TSU for a long time. I started in the sociology department. Mm -hmm. Then in 1994, we created the Department of Africana mm -hmm. Studies. And since 1994, I have served for the last 13 years as chair mm -hmm. of the Department of Africana Studies, Tennessee State University. Very good. You know, uh, Dr. Allardy, when we talk about Malcolm X, I think that uh, many people, and especially uh, younger people, might not uh, understand exactly who this individual was. And what we'd like to do today is for you to uh, not only talk about uh, Malcolm X, but to give us a little background information in reference to who he was and other information that you think that we ought to be interested in. Well, uh, as I said earlier, I started, my interest in Malcolm started by mm -hmm. reading Autobiography for Malcolm X. I think I must have read it about seven times. Mm -hmm. And that was what inspired me, you know, to become a Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of Malcolm, here's a man mm -hmm. born 1925 in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm in the Midwest uh, s uh, just before the Great Depression. Mm -hmm. And then as a result of that, uh, you know, his parents were followers of Marcus Garvey. Mm -hmm. We've talked mm -hmm. about Garvey in an earlier show. And while he, he was growing up there in, in Omaha, Nebraska, mm -hmm. uh, because of the advocacy of his father, the family was often attacked by the mm -hmm. Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. And so when we get to, uh, say, 1931, uh, he's about six years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, some say he was in kindergarten, maybe, you know, mm -hmm. first grade. Uh, his father w was killed, assassinated mm -hmm. by the Klan. Mm -hmm. And he and his father were very close Good. and obviously mm -hmm. that had a very traumatic effect on him. Mm -hmm. And then as he grew older and went to the seventh or eighth grade around age 14, his mother had a nervous breakdown Good. and then she was committed to the Kalamazoo Mental Hospital in Kalamazoo, mm -hmm. uh, Michigan. And at that time, uh, he just started losing all interest in school. He dropped out. Uh, he was committed to a number of foster homes and juvenile mm -hmm. detention homes. So I think that was the thing that started him to drift uh, mm -hmm. into a world of juvenile delinquency. Good. Okay. His uh, oldest sister by his father's first wife, Daisy May uh, mm -hmm. Little, uh, saw him and then decided to take him from um, uh, from, from Michigan mm -hmm. to Boston, uh, where he went to Roxbury, which is like the, the black, uh, mm -hmm. you know, suburban area of Boston. Mm -hmm. And from that point, that was when he started to go into the world of, of crime. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that maybe we should 
tell the audience who Malcolm's father was. Yeah. His, his father's name was Reverend Earl Little, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. his mother was Louisa Little, mm -hmm. who was from Granada. Okay, and so this older sister, by mm -hmm. the first marriage, kept reminding him of uh, the father and the commitment mm -hmm. to the philosopher Marcus Garvey. Now, the thing that uh, tipped the scale for Malcolm, uh, of course, mm -hmm. his father's killed by the Klan when he's six years old. Mm -hmm. Uh, his mother's committed to a mental institution mm -hmm. by age 14. And the thing that tipped the scale in terms of him leaving uh, grade school was that he told his teacher that mm -hmm. he wanted to be a lawyer. And let, let's uh, break here with, for mm -hmm. this uh, first commercial break, uh, Doctor, and then we'll pick up at this particular point. Mm -hmm. We'll be back with you following this short commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to the second segment of the show for today. We're talking to Dr. Al Hadi, uh, the chairperson of the African Studies Department at Tennessee State University, and the topic is Malcolm X. Uh, doctor, uh, let's uh, continue that uh, conversation that I so abruptly interrupted uh, during our first uh, segment here. Let's continue that. Well, our subject here is Malcolm, Malcolm Little. That mm -hmm. was his name. Mm -hmm. And so when he went to Boston, that's when he sort of got involved in crime. Mm -hmm. uh, then, of course, he uh, went to New York, where he really got mm -hmm. involved in the underworld. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, he, he became uh, a thief. Uh, he had a burglar ring. He also was a pimp, a hustler. Mm -hmm. And uh, so finally, uh, in 1946, he got arrested mm -hmm. and was uh, sentenced to prison uh, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, he actually served six and a half years uh, mm -hmm. of, uh, of his prison term. But while in prison in, in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. uh, he uh, was visited by some of members of his family, and they started telling him about the Nation of Islam. Yeah, okay and about Elijah Muhammad and Master Farad Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And so because of the experiences he had had mm -hmm. uh, with crime and also his background mm -hmm. growing up uh, within the uh, Marcus Garvey uh, family, mm -hmm. uh, he started to listen. But now at first he wasn't too much interested okay. in religion. Mm -hmm. So when his brother approached him, he told him that, Malcolm, I know a way that you can get out of prison. Mm -hmm. And so he just thought it was a, uh, uh, being a hustler, yeah, he thought uh, it was some kind of scam. He okay. said, uh -huh. So he told him to stop eating pork, okay. uh, stop smoking cigarettes, and stop using profanity. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's all? He said, well, yeah, mm -hmm. that's all you need to do. And uh, so he didn't know at the time that he was being preconditioned okay. uh, for a religious conversion. Mm -hmm. And so he stopped doing that, and people started looking at him differently. And so mm -hmm. over time, he became a model prisoner. Mm -hmm. And also he started to study uh, the teachings of the Nation of Islam mm -hmm. when he was told uh, that the white man was the devil, mm -hmm. which he had no problem in believing mm -hmm. because after all his father had been killed by mm -hmm. the white folks, well, the okay. Klan, mm -hmm. he had two uncles mm -hmm. or three uncles that had been killed by the Klan. Mm -hmm. uh, his mother had been committed to an insane asylum by white folks. Mm -hmm. And also the fact that uh, when he was arrested, mm -hmm. uh, he was involved with two white women mm -hmm. and they were used as um, sort of go-betweens, okay. they would go to the homes, mm -hmm. case the homes, and then report back to him. Mm -hmm. And then he and his, his uh, uh, associates would go and break in the home when the, uh, when the family wasn't at home. Mm -hmm. So he put, you know, one and one equals two. He figured it all out. Well, these are the people that are responsible for me being in prison, mm -hmm. so I know they got to be dealt okay. with, you know. Mm -hmm. But one thing that he never could digest was that the white man was, uh, that the black man, rather, was God. Mm -hmm. He couldn't quite fathom that in mm -hmm. his mind, but he did readily accept the fact that the white man was the devil. Mm -hmm. So when he got out of prison in 1952, uh, mm -hmm. then he uh, went to Detroit uh, with his brother. He was on, uh, on mm -hmm. parole mm -hmm. uh, because he only served six and a half okay. years out of the 10 year sentence that he was given. So uh, once he met Elijah Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad started to teach him. So in a very short period of time, mm -hmm. I'd say about two years, he became uh, the minister of the temple in Harlem, uh, mm -hmm. temple number seven. And shortly after that, he became the national spokesperson for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, at the time that he received uh, these teachings of Islam, he did not know, uh, did not realize that these teachings were not exactly mm -hmm. what Islam was all about. Mm -hmm. And in order to show the difference, let me just tell the audience what okay. true Islam is. Well, first mm -hmm. of all, Islam means total submission to the mm -hmm. will of Allah. A person who accepts this becomes a Muslim. Mm -hmm. uh, the proper name for God is Allah. 
and the holy text of the Muslims is, is, is the Quran. Mm -hmm. And there are five basic beliefs that you must have. First mm -hmm. of all, that there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is last and final messenger. You must also pray five times a day, mm -hmm. give two and a half percent of your wealth in charity, mm -hmm. and then you should also fast during the month of Ramadan. And uh, as fate would have it, we are now trying to cite the new moon to begin the fasting mm -hmm. of Ramadan mm -hmm. at this very mm -hmm. moment. Ramadan here will, in, uh, will start either Saturday or mm -hmm. Sunday. Mm -hmm. Then finally, we have the pilgrimage to Mecca, mm -hmm. which comes in the last um, month of the um, Islamic calendar, mm -hmm. which is the month of Hajj. Mm -hmm. And that was the, uh, the thing that uh, when Malcolm made the pilgrimage to Mecca, that would allow him to see clearly the mm -hmm. difference between mm -hmm. the type of Islam he was taught well, and okay. Islam that mm -hmm. uh, he eventually came to uh, accept mm -hmm. uh, as true Islam or mainstream Islam. Mm -hmm. But as things developed, Malcolm became very popular. As a matter of fact, as early as 1958, mm -hmm. he traveled abroad uh, to Sudan, to Egypt, uh, and mm -hmm. to Turkey. And he had a chance to see true Islam mm -hmm. as early as 1958. So when he came back, he had a different kind of perspective, perspective. Okay. on Islam in contrast to what uh, he had mm -hmm. been taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. So as, as things kept unraveling, people inside of the Nation of Islam became somewhat jealous of him. Yeah. And they started taking his articles out of the Muhammad Speaks newspaper. Mm. Uh, and you know, the jealousy and animosity started to develop. So eventually, uh, they tried to figure out some way to get him out of the Nation of mm. Islam. And the incident that he used as a pretext of getting him out of the Nation of Islam was uh, when President John F. Kennedy was assassinated mm -hmm. on November 22nd, mm -hmm. 1963. Uh, Elijah Muhammad sent an executive order for none of his ministers to say anything mm -hmm. about the incident. So Malcolm, after giving a speech, inadvertently said that the assassination of Kennedy was a case of the chickens coming home. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what did he want to say that? I for? remember <laughs> that <laughs> statement. I remember. He uh -huh. made that statement, mm -hmm. and then initially he was suspended from the Nation of mm -hmm. Islam for 90 days. But he eventually realized that he was not going to be admitted back into the Nation of mm -hmm. Islam. So he then went to the Islamic Center in Brooklyn, New York, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and there at the Islamic Center, mm -hmm. he became a true and proper Muslim. Mm -hmm. And once he converted uh, in, in 1964, uh, he then uh, made mm -hmm. arrangements to go to Mecca mm -hmm. so that he could really see the entire Muslim world and travel throughout the Muslim mm -hmm. world. And so the Malcolm that left the Nation of Islam in 1964, around mm -hmm. March of 64, and the one that went to Mecca in um, uh, April of 1964 mm -hmm. was totally different from the mm -hmm. Malcolm X uh, mm -hmm. that developed in, in mm -hmm. terms of uh, after his pilgrimage to Mecca mm -hmm. in 1964. Very good. And mm -hmm. I tell you, I, I think that this might be uh, a good point to stop for this uh, second commercial break, mm -hmm. after which we come, we can come back and then you can uh, sort of uh, give us, us the information relative to the assassination mm -hmm. and really the legacy. I think you gave us a lot of information dealing with the legacy of uh, Marcus uh, Garvey. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that uh, Malcolm has, uh, certainly his legacy might not be as great as uh, Marcus Garvey's legacy, but uh, certainly he, uh, and, and I'm sure that you have a lot of information ref in reference to that uh, legacy. Okay. And of course, let us uh, take the second commercial break, and we'll be back with our audience following this second commercial break. Thank you and welcome back to this final segment of the show for the day. The topic is Malcolm X. The guest is Dr. Aladee, the chairperson of Africana Studies at Tennessee State University. And of course, doctor, before we uh, had our break, uh, you promised that you would give us some information relative to Malcolm outside mm. of the uh, nation. And of course, we'll give you an opportunity to do that now. Yeah, the Malcolm outside of the nation of Islam was uh, uh, a new man, mm -hmm. totally transformed. He never, he, he didn't continue to spout uh, uh, racist rhetoric. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a person who was actually moving a lot closer to Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, in February of 1965, mm -hmm. just before his assassination, he'd actually gone to Selma, Alabama in mm -hmm. order to form a coalition of conscience with Martin Luther mm -hmm. King. 
Unfortunately, at the time, Dr. King was in jail, mm -hmm. but he did take counsel with his wife, Coretta Scott King, mm -hmm. Andrew Young, Bernard Lockett, okay. as well as John Lewis. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to say that he made some mistakes when he was inside of the Nation of Islam, mm -hmm. and he understood that Martin Luther King's strategy mm -hmm. of freedom, justice, and equality was the best way for our people to go. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to take the civil rights struggle from the level of civil rights to the level of human rights. Mm -hmm. And rather than trying to lodge our case with the United States Supreme Court, mm -hmm. he wanted to make an argument for uh, human rights uh, mm -hmm. before the United Nations and the World Court, mm -hmm. because he actually saw, uh, you know, today, for example, we hear people talking about genocide going on mm -hmm. in the Sudan yeah. and mm -hmm. other parts of the world. In 1964 and 65, Malcolm was saying that uh, the white supremacist government of this country, the mm -hmm. white supremacists in this country were actually committing acts of genocide mm -hmm. against African Americans. Mm -hmm. So he was making the case for genocide mm -hmm. and, and also making the case for human rights. Mm -hmm. And he was trying to get a buy-in from Dr. King in order to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember now, uh, both Dr. King and Malcolm had gone outside of this country in 1964. Mm -hmm. Malcolm made the pilgrimage in April of 64, okay. and Dr. King got the Nobel Peace Prize mm -hmm. in uh, December uh, of, of 1964. Mm -hmm. So when both of these men came back inside of the United States mm -hmm. in 1964, they had shifted from a race-based analysis mm -hmm. of the problem to more or less a class analysis mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. also an international anal mm -hmm. analysis. You remember Dr. King was talking about voting rights. Okay. He mm -hmm. was also talking about, uh, he started to move against the war in what, Vietnam. Uh, okay. And, and Malcolm had already mm -hmm. been there you, mm -hmm. some years early, even when he was in the Nation of Islam. Mm -hmm. So they both started to deal more with human rights mm -hmm. issues. They both started to deal with international issues, mm -hmm. being opposed to the war in Vietnam, being opposed to the apartheid government in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And it's so it looked as though the two men were starting to come together. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, he was assassinated on February 21st, uh, 1965, which was on a Sunday at 3 o'clock. That following Tuesday, mm -hmm. he was supposed to meet with mm -hmm. uh, Martin Luther King at the home of Sidney Poitier. Mm -hmm. They were supposed to come together and have a discussion about how Malcolm could get on board mm -hmm. with the civil rights movement and take it to the next level. Mm -hmm. Because there's no doubt that Malcolm completely dominated the ghettos of the North, mm -hmm. and also some of the ghettos on the West Coast, like Los Angeles, mm -hmm. San Francisco, and so forth. King completely dominated the Southern region. Okay. So the mm -hmm. leaders, these two leaders, one uh, being the champion of the uh, the blacks in the inner Urban. cities of mm -hmm. the North, and other one being the champion of the working class in the South, mm -hmm. as well as the, peas the peasants, mm -hmm. the sharecroppers in the South, mm -hmm. in Alabama, mm -hmm. and Mississippi, and mm -hmm. Arkansas. So had those two men come together in 1965, mm -hmm. the kind of problems that we're looking at now would probably not be in mm -hmm. existence because those two men, I think, working mm -hmm. in tandem, working together, would have been the type of unity that we needed mm -hmm. on the international front as well as the local mm -hmm. scene. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you spoke uh, earlier about uh, uh, Dr. King and uh, Malcolm, and I think that at, at, at one time you indicated that uh, uh, Malcolm and King sort of uh, play the same role mm -hmm. in a real sense, and, 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 and they were both uh, disliked intensely by uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, uh, touch upon that. I mean, what was Malcolm's relationship with uh, Mr. Hoover, and, and why? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and I think that there, there's even some suggestion that the government might have had something to do with his assassination, even though the government itself did not assassinate him. He was, uh, uh, from what I understand, he was assassinated by members of the uh, Nation of Islam's organization. But talk, speak to that. Yeah, that was a myth, I think, and I would want to call it a myth, mm -hmm. that was sort of operating inside of the intelligence community mm -hmm. uh, in this country at that time. And much of it had to do with the fact that we were in the Cold War, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, communism versus the, the Western so-called mm -hmm. democracies. And so, J. Edgar Hoover had this idea that he wanted to stop the rise of a messiah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. almost like Pharaoh during the times of Moses. Mm -hmm. And he did see Dr. King mm -hmm. and Malcolm as the possibility of being that messiah mm -hmm. that would rise up among the African Americans mm -hmm. and free them uh, from the bondage of modern day Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And so that was the mythology that J. Edgar Hoover operated out. And mm -hmm. I would think that even to this very day, 
there's still that paranoia that mm -hmm. somehow the Most High will uh, mm -hmm. uh, come with divine intervention and raise up another Messiah mm -hmm. uh, in our midst who will mm -hmm. free us from uh, that type of oppression. Mm -hmm. But that was the type of mythology that was operating mm -hmm. that time period. And also the fact that uh, just before Malcolm and Martin, right. you know, you had Paul Robeson okay. and W.E.B. Du Bois mm -hmm. who had declared themselves as communists. Oh, good. And uh -huh. they had traveled to the Soviet mm -hmm. Union and Eastern Europe. So there was the possibility mm -hmm. that, that, that they two, too uh -huh. would make those links okay. uh -huh. uh, with, the, with the communist faction mm -hmm. outside of this country. So the Cold War played a major role mm -hmm. in how uh, the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, there were people in King's movement that had to leave the movement because people thought that they were communists. communists. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King in the early 50s was accused of being a communist, mm -hmm. you know. So I think that was the kind of uh, idea that J. Edgar Hoover mm -hmm. was operating mm -hmm. from, this, this fear of communism mm -hmm. rising up uh, in the form of a black messiah mm -hmm. among African Americans. Now, uh, now what is the uh, legacy of uh, Dr., uh, I mean, of, of Malcolm X? Sure. I mean, uh, what role do you think that he continues to play in our society today? In my judgment, I think the, the legacy of, uh, as I would call him, El Haj Malik El Shabazz, because uh -huh. when he made the pilgrimage to Mecca, oh. he changed his name. Mm -hmm. I think that when you look at the year 1965, mm -hmm. this was a very powerful year. This is a year that mm -hmm. Malcolm made the pilgrimage to Mecca. Mm -hmm. This is a year mm -hmm. that Dr. King uh, did the Selma to Montgomery March mm -hmm. in terms of the Voting Rights Act. But it, it, he was effective in linking the Muslim world mm -hmm. with African-American Muslims mm -hmm. in this country. Mm -hmm. He was also effective in linking the African continent with mm -hmm. the struggle inside mm -hmm. of this country. Mm -hmm. So as a spokesperson for Pan-Africanism and also a spokesperson for Muslims all over the world, mm -hmm. I think he was very effective in making that link. Mm -hmm. And then when he, once he made that link of American Muslims in general and African-Americans mm -hmm. in particular, with the Muslim world, 